Today is the third part of a series that I am super excited to preach on. I actually had the last message when I started the series. And it's been a great series titled The Breath of Life. And today we're going to talk about going from dust to life, from dust to life. It takes incredible faith to go from seeing to believing. And that was the case, case with Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 37. God took Ezekiel in the spirit by the hand of the Lord to a valley of dry bones and said, what do you see? All of us can see situations that seem hopeless. In many cases in the world around us, things can seem hopeless. Struggles, challenges, things that we burn down to the ground, failures, mistakes, hardship. Every single one of us has to face those kind of things. Jesus made it clear that in this world we'd have trouble, but to take heart because he overcame the world. And so it took faith. By faith, last week I shared Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or what I would call the breath of life. And when God breathes his life into you, when you hear his voice and you are obedient, you go from hopeless to hopeful every single time. And it's a repetitive pattern. We're always having to have hope in the midst of difficult situations and we're always having to believe differently than what we see with our natural eye. Our natural eye points to a valley of dry bones, death, destruction, hopelessness, cut off. It looks really bad in the natural. But God says, when you hear my word and you trust my voice, I see things differently than the way that you see things in the natural. The key is going to be for us to start seeing things the way he sees them. And the only way you're going to do that is by faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not seen. So there's an evidence and there's a substance. It's not blind faith. It's trusting God no matter what, every single time, no matter the outcome. It's remaining consistent and not giving up and backing down. And the devil always works on overtime to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't ever want you advancing. And the minute that you make a decision that you're going to move towards the things of God, he makes an extra concerted effort to knock you back. It's familiar spirits from your past. They had you in their grip for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I don't know how long it is for, us, for some of you, but don't think that they want to let go so easily. So they come back to say, hey, come back to us. Come back to your old ways. Return back to the things that brought you pleasure and joy before. But God says, no, you're mine now. When you give your life to him, you become his. And he takes you from a place of death to life. He takes you from a place where your sin was once crimson scarlet, and he makes you white as snow. He takes you from a place where you're lost to found, from stuck to free again, from a valley of dry bones to a mighty army For the kingdom of God. It all comes down to what you see and what you say. And if you don't have the breath of life coursing through your veins, breathing in your face, then you're not going to have the belief, the hope, the faith, and the confidence every single time to overcome. Not only for yourself, but to help other people overcome. From the breath of death to the breath of life. And to really understand the breath of life, we have to go back to the garden. And I love talking about the garden. The garden is one of my favorite things to talk about. We have the two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. We have the result of the curse. We have what life was like before the offset when Adam and Eve ate from the tree. We have the job description for all humanity, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, reign, and have dominion. We have your job title, which is a gardener, which is tending and taking care of what God's already created. We have rest. Everything points back to the garden and points forward to a garden. Jesus prayed in a garden. Jesus will come back to a garden. And Jesus wants our hearts to be gardens. And it was in the garden that Adam was created. So let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the what? The breath of life, and man became a living being. I love this word form, or to be formed. To be formed means to fashion or to frame. It means that God created us for both human and divine purposes. 
God was intentional when he created man. Just like he fluttered over the earth when it was void and without form, like a mother hen with expectation. God knew exactly what he wanted to do. First was the natural, which was in disorder and disarray, and then God put it into order and brought the spiritual. And so with Adam, God would form him or vex him or stretch him from the dust of the ground with a purpose and with an intent. The best way for me to tell you that is it's predetermined. Now, don't get sidetracked with predestination. A better word is predetermined. And the word determined means God has, a, has made a resolution. I've determined and I've resolved that there is a purpose for your life and I want to see it accomplished and I'm creating you for a great destiny or destination in your life. Another great way to think about it is a potter making clay. So first off, the clay doesn't tell the potter what to make. Second of all, the potter has a plan in his mind or an aim or a purpose when he sits down at the wheel to make that clay into something beautiful or a vessel or whatever he's going to make. So the potter always has a purpose, and that's the case when man was created. This also is the understanding that from distress and from being pressed, God makes you into something. He narrows you, cramps you, and straightens you, and spreads you out, lays you out like making a bed. It's the same concept when David said, if I make my bed in hell, God, you will be there. So when God made man out of the ground, he formed him, fashioned him, molded him, stretched him, vexed him, and then he breathed life, where? Into his nostrils. Nostrils are really important. The nose is really important. The olfactory bulb or the olfactory system, which is responsible for your smell, it serves so many purposes inside your head and your body. So many purposes. Not only does it support the sense of smell, but it directly feeds information to your brain. God knew exactly what he's doing when he would breathe into the nostrils of man. When your olfactory system is damaged or disrupted, You can struggle with the joy of eating foods, drinking drinks, or feeling uh, uh, a loss because you don't know the smell of something beautiful, perfumes, flowers, fresh baked bread, muffins, cinnamon rolls, whatever it is. Not only that, it can lead to being depressed because that whole system is damaged inside your head and in turn, you're not getting that sense activated. The other dangers include not being able to detect dangers like leaking gas or spoiled food. Your nose is one of the most complex, elegant organs in your body, and it performs critical life life functions and really deserves massive props in keeping you healthy, safe, and alive. It also can affect your intimacy with your spouse, but we'll save that for the Firestorm School of Ministry. Your nose is the first organ in your upper respiratory system and one of the main reasons you both survive and thrive. It's one of the primary pathways, obviously, to your own breath and to your lungs. Your nose humidifies the air going into your lungs. It affects the sound of your voice. It filters and cleans the air that you breathe. Pollution, allergens, smoke, bacteria, viruses, and even small bugs. All of that bad debris gets caught up in your nose and sent to your stomach to be dealt with instead of into your lungs. Smell plays a key role in taste, bitter, sour, sweet, salty. That's why food is tasteless when you can't smell. It also keeps us safe and protects us from spoiled food, dangers in the air, gases, smoke, etc., also deals with viruses. That's why COVID virus is tested in your nose. It's associated also with memory and emotions. Your nose and sinuses play a huge role in the immune functionality of your body and also plays an important role in your balance. So the nose is important. And when God chose to breathe into man's nose, not only did he just give him breath, but he gave him life that went to every part of his well-being. So obviously, when you have sinus infections, which I've been battling on occasion over this last year, 
you just feel terrible. Your ears ring, your head pounds, you don't feel balanced, food doesn't taste good, everything's off. Your sinuses are so important. So we have this, what is that thing called? A sinugator. It's this electric pump that shoots water like a neti pot, but shoots water in your nose, salt water. I use it all the time to keep my nose clear, especially with all the junk. I mean, we've had COVID twice. And this last time, my sinuses have been just stopped up for the longest time. Anybody else? And so when you can't smell, you can't think straight, when your head's clogged, all those things. And it affects so much of your life. So God was very specific when he breathed the breath of life into your nostrils. And we're going to look at this again here in just a little bit. But I want to go back to the potter and the potter's wheel. When I gave my life to the Lord, it was right after Hurricane Andrew in 1992. I was following the Grateful Dead around the country, was doing drugs, partying like a wild man, and I had gotten busted for drugs going to a Grateful Dead concert, and I was facing a third-degree felony. Right after I had gotten busted, Hurricane Andrew, Category 5, rolled right over my apartment in Saga Bay or, or Cutler Ridge, South Miami, Florida. And I had evacuated to my mom's apartment in, or my mom's house in Florida City, which is by Homestead, and the whole house caved in on top of us. And the only place I had to go was back to this damaged, destruct, destroyed apartment building. And it was in that apartment on the fourth floor, everything's damaged, 300,000 people homeless, that I hit complete rock bottom. And I remember opening up my Bible and there were two passages that I read. Now I had not surrendered my life fully to the Lord. I was not born again at the time. When I flipped it open, I read in Matthew chapter seven about the man who builds his house on the sand versus the rock. And that when the wind and the rain and the floods come, that house falls with a mighty crash. And I knew I was the guy that had built my house on the sand. And now my house was caving in on top of of me. But then later, as I spun out even more, as I got fired from my job and I started doing more drugs and just, I went to a really bad, dark place. I was facing prison time. It was a horrible spot in my life. It was at that time that I picked up my Bible again and I turned to this passage of scripture in Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. Now, I absolutely love this because God's saying, I have something to tell you and if you're gonna hear it and you wanna know what it is, you need to go to this place. That's why God uses all kinds of things to reveal himself to you. It's also why so many people say, well, I just, my church is at the beach or my church is mountain biking or hiking or in the mountains or on the boat fishing. So many people say, I don't need church. I don't need people. And that's not God's design. But God does reveal himself through all of creation. Romans chapter one makes it clear that the invisible attributes of God are revealed through the things that you see and experience on earth. And in this case, God's saying, I've got a word for you at the potter's house. And so many times God will speak to you in creation and outside and in other places. But God also has a purpose and a plan inside this house with people in community, in family. So God says, hey, I'm taking you to the potter's house. And I almost liken the potter's house to the woodshed. Because this is a place where molding, shaping, and fashioning takes place. This is also a place where correction and things inside of your life that have spun out that God deals with. And so he says, go to the potter's house. I'm going to cause you to hear my words. So then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. So marred clay means it spun out of whack or got out of the design of what it was create, was being created to be. And when you get out of God's design, you're gonna go out of your mind. It's inevitable. God's laws ultimately will always break us if we don't get back into the design that God has for us. And so I liken the potter's wheel to like a silversmith or to a goldsmith refining the gold. Hammer, fire, hammer, fire. Turn up the heat, hammer, fire. 
And so in this case, what happens when the pottery gets or the clay gets out of whack? If you've ever done pottery before, what do you do? And I can see the Lord smashing us down. That was the case for me. Prison, drugs, failures, broken, brokenness in every area of my life. I had spun out of whack. And I knew that I was a guy that had a call and a purpose from God, that I had gifts and talents, talents that I misused for my own purposes. And so, and I could see God smashing down. And many of you are like, man, the devil, the devil. And it's like, no, this is the Lord correcting, directing, fixing. Because realize what happened when the clay got out of its design. It was marred. So it had to be refashioned into another vessel more beautiful than the first one. And that's the picture of being born again. All of us at one time or another spun out. Maybe some of you are spinning out right now. All of us are ten in the natural ten to in the natural just burn things to the ground. Some of you are like are incredibly good at burning things to the ground. But if you actually look at the composition of dust, today it can be pollutants and all kinds of bad things. But go back to the garden. It probably had volcanic ash in it. And God says, Isaiah 61, 3, I will trade beauty for ashes. And so what God does is when you surrender your life and you come to the cross, God makes a trade. And he says, you were dry bones, you were hopeless, you were cut off. It looked like you were in complete disarray, but I'm going to refashion you. You got sidetracked, you got off your purpose, you got off your design, you spent your things on yourself and your lusts and your pleasures. So now what I have to do is, and it's funny because some of us, especially you younger ones, if you're a teenager, it's like, this is the sound of God repeatedly. And then as you get a little older, and then when you get real older, it's like, because you learn in time. My best advice for everybody that's 20 and under is be a modern day Joshua who dwelt in the temple, who dwelt in the tent of meeting. Even when Moses left, Joshua made the decision to stay in the house of the Lord and pray. My challenge to every one of you is to be like David. Men and women after God's heart, no matter what, even when there's failures and mistakes, you're repentant, you're broken, and you're running to God and you own it. The best thing you can do is own it. Don't pretend, don't hide, don't run away. The minute that you get isolated is the minute that you get picked off. Yep. Stay in community, stay in relationship. Never give up. I'll tell you this a thousand times over. And after failures and mistakes my entire life, I never gave up. And God always, 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 always refashioned me remolded me and remade me to be who he was calling me to be. And he'll do it for you a thousand times over. It's never too late. You're never too old. But if, man, if the teenagers and the young adults with raging hormones and a world screaming, screaming louder through social media, <coughs> you all got to get this. Be aggressive. Be intentional. Be the fish swimming in the opposite direction upriver. You're not of this world anymore. And it's aggressive and the world's aggressive and violent. But the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Meaning it's coming at me violent. I'm coming back at it violent. The gates of hell, storming the gates of hell is an offensive strategy, not a defensive strategy. And it always takes effort and it takes faith and it takes work. What do you see? So many times I want to give up. And many times you're going to want to give up. You're going to feel like, man, it's... Too much drama, too hard, broken people, church again, witnessing, preaching, sharing. It all takes faith. It all takes intentionality. And it all takes many times doing something that calls you out of your comfort zone. It's so much easier to just live a life under yourself. It seems like, but you'll be miserable because you'll miss that predetermined destiny that God put inside of you when you were formed and fashioned out of the dust of the earth. 
It'd be easy for us. Many times I've thought, man, just take me back to my little island retreat with 40 palm trees and my little Boston whaler in Port A. And man, I'm drinking coffee and I'm riding fat tire bikes with dolphins swimming under my feet. And I got my bride and it's a beautiful life. And man, what a great life we could live. But God's not going to let you stay and live comfortably because your life is not for yourself. You were created with a purpose and a design. And if we would have stayed there, even though it would have seemed comfortable in the natural, we would have died. Sundays and Wednesdays and sharing and how many times I'm at the grocery store or someplace, the last thing I want to do is witness because I don't feel it. But I don't let my feelings dictate. And God says, speak, you speak. It takes intentionality. And the, pot, the clay does not tell the potter what to do. Or what to make. And so the clay would have to be reformed and refashioned. It would be smashed down, remade, spinning, molding, water, pressing, shaping, designing, and making you into be what God's called you to be. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, O house of Rock City, O body of Christ, O Corpus Christi, O Nueces County, O Texas, O nation. United States of America. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. That's why you got to understand how God actually views and understands the nations. Psalm 2 makes it clear. Why do the nations rage and plot a vain, pointless, useless, waste of time thing? I'll hold them in derision and I'll, ha, 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 woo, man, they have no idea. No idea. God literally laughs and holds the nations in derision. They can't plot a vain thing. They may be plotting, but it's vain. Every tongue that rises in judgment against you, God will condemn. And so this is powerful because God says, I have authority over the nations. And if they relent, then the disaster that I thought to bring upon it, I will relent from. Verse 9, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey the breath of life or my voice, then I will relent concerning the good in which I said I would benefit it. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. God wants to bring the breath of life. But if the nations and people stay obstinate and stubborn and rejecting the breath of life, it becomes the breath of death. And God's making it clear. I'm letting the nations know in advance, repent, turn from the wicked ways. All of us need to repent and turn from our own wicked ways. Receive the breath of life and come back into the design that God's called us to come back into. Verse 12, and I love this. I mean, I don't like what they said, but I love the connection with Ezekiel 37. In Ezekiel 37, verse 14, they said, the dry bones said, we're hopeless and we're cut off. These people, these nations said, that is hopeless. The word of God coming to Jesus is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans and we will everyone obey the dictates of his evil heart. The stubborn dictates of man's imagination and walking in their own plans brings the breath of death. It's the deceptive lie that coming to Jesus and surrounding your life fully to him is hopeless. So we choose to fashion our own selves. Hence, the marred clay that had to be refashioned by him. I have so many people that catch me in various places that know I'm a pastor. And they say, can I get a minute? Can I get some time with you? But they don't want to come here. They don't want to surrender their lives. And I'll give most everybody a minute, maybe five. My minute's more like five or ten. I can't say anything short. And I'll preach the gospel. I'll tell them the truth. I'll see the design in their life. I'll love them. I'll encourage them. But at some point, it becomes a waste of my time because they're not willing to come to the cross. And every single one of us has to come to the cross. People want the policy, 
but they don't want to pay the price. They want the benefit of the policy, but they don't want to pay the price. And it's like, listen, I care about you and I love you, but until you forsake all and come to the cross and get born again, you can't disciple somebody that's not a disciple. Now, I can love you. I can point you in the right direction. But we have to be the ones to own it and say, I've spun out. I got sideways. I was on that wheel. I know God has a purpose and a destiny and a plan. And maybe some of you don't know that and you're hopeless. Well, guess what? I'm going to tell you God has a plan for your life. You're going to hear the clarion voice that God loves you. You have a design. He made a resolution. He knows who he's called you. He knows you intimately and he calls you by name. And so these people that I talk to, they have got to come to the place of realizing, and so do all of us, that coming to Jesus is not hopeless. Coming to Jesus is transformative. Now, I know that from my story, but you got to know that from your story. I know what Jesus can do because I know what he's done for me. And I tell people that. But most of the time, the people that I run into on the streets or that, you know, have church hurt or dysfunctional lenses on their soul from their past or eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I have to literally try to convince them to surrender all and come to Jesus. And if they don't do it from the right heart, they're not going to stay and it's not going to stick. And so I challenge all of you, go all in. Don't dictate your life any longer by telling the potter what to make. We have to turn from evil and obey the breath of life that brings life. The potter has a plan and a purpose, a determined resolution. And sometimes he has to make you again and again and again. Here's the great thing about God is he never gives up, no matter how hard it is. And that's why I tell you, man, when you start manifesting, stuff starts coming to the surface. It's always an opportunity to get it out. Fire, hammer, fire, hammer, get the coal out, get the dross out turn up the heat, fire hammer, fire hammer. And yeah, the devil's trying to lie and accuse in the process, but stop listening to the lies of the devil. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Mercy, God, mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I love you. I care about you. I'm for you. I'm not against you. You're not condemned. Come out of that old life. Come into the new life that I have for you. That's what the Lord says every single time. This is amazing news. You guys should be fired up. Woo! This is the beauty of the blood. It's always speaking a better word. The blood of Jesus is always talking. And you know what it says? Forgiveness, redemption. I love you. Get it out. Come out. Come out, that lion spirit. Come out, devil. Come out, shame. Come out, victim mentality. Come out, depression. Come out, worry. Come out, fear. And when you start seeing that stuff, you tell it, get out of my life in Jesus' name. You have a, you have a, if you're born again, you have a full-grown Jesus living in you. You have authority in your life. So much as, man, I got to have somebody else bring deliverance. Well, it's not a formula. Maybe sometimes you do. Maybe sometimes you don't. Once you start understanding the word and who you are as sons and daughters and the power of the cross and the power of the blood, You start cutting that thing. You put an ax to the root. You renounce it. You renounce the hidden areas of shame. You pick yourself up and you put your forehead like flint. And you become an army. Don't stay dry bones anymore. And if there's any dry bones in me, come out. Reform. If there's dry bones in you, let's get it out. And that requires a price that we all have to pay. And it's a price to hear God's voice. So many of us just want the easy way. Podcasts, YouTube preachers. Friends, call up, calling you up on the phone. When God says, call me up on my hotline, Jeremiah 33.3, Deuteronomy 33.3, all his sons sit. This is Deuteronomy 33.3. We all know, should know Jeremiah 33.3. But Deuteronomy 33.3 is a powerful 3.3.3. Because it literally talks about his sons and daughters receiving instruction by sitting at his feet. Not one of us gets to bypass the woodshed or the potter's wheel or intimacy in the secret place. That's why I love Psalm 91.1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
Let's all say this together. Say, dwell there. Dwell there. Abide here. Abide here. Say, dwell there. Dwell there. Shadow, here. shadow here. So remember how the apostle's shadow would heal people? Whose shadow was it really coming out of them? That's why we all have to learn to hear God's voice and get the breath of life and sit at his feet. What you do in private, God reveals in secret. So what we do is we renounce 1 Corinthians 4, the hidden, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4. We renounce hidden areas of shame. Okay, understand what it means to renounce. I forsake you. I don't want you. You're a liar. Get out of my life every single time. And when I get marred and sidetracked, and God says, reform, refashion, reset, 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 reset. And I say, whatever it takes, God, you're a good father. He's a good father. He's better than the earthly dad you ever had. Our earthly dads can't even remotely compare. Even in my best love for my children, I can't compare to the greatness and consistency and awesomeness of the heavenly father. I want to try. I want to be like the heavenly father to my kids. You want to be like his heart to your children. But he's the best. And even in his discipline, even in his reshaping, even his reforming, God always makes you into be something better than you were before. The key is stay the course, stay the pocket, and get to the cross every time. We have a generation that's walked away from the cross, but the blood's at the cross. Life is at the cross. Death is at the cross. But death always leads to resurrection. The curse of Adam brought death. But the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And I love this little passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42. Now, this passage of Scripture I'm about to read to you, the context of this started with a question. What will your body look like after the resurrection in the end. Now, you know, we all want to know that. I can assure you, I'm going to be younger, buffer, ripped. I'm going to be like 25. I'm going to give Gabriel and Michael a run for their money. I'm just like, we all have a picture of what our body after the resurrection in heaven is going to look like, right? And that was the question. You guys should go read this whole section of scripture. It's pretty incredible. But what I'm going to read to you right now, even though it's talking about the resurrection from the dead, if Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetime, it's also talking about resurrection now. I believe it's both. Let's read it. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. It is sown in in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. So we see we have dishonor, we have corruption, and we have weakness. And God makes the trade. That's why I say just die now. Just get on the wheel and let him refashion you. Let him remake you. Let him breathe his breath of life into you so that you can become what God's called you to become. Raised in glory, honor, strength, and power, and a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. It's from dust to life, from dust to dust, from now to dust to life. Look at verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, which we all have borne the image of the man of dust, now we bear the image of the heavenly man. The image of the heavenly man. You know, in the Bible, the word face is used for countenance. So when God says, seek my face, and our heart says, your face, O Lord, I will seek, when God gets in our face and breathes in our face, everything changes. How you think, how you feel, how you perceive life, your sense of well-being, it changes everything. 
I mean, I, some of you are really great con artists, or we have been in the past. You got a great poker face. Like, you're never going to show anything on your face. But most people, like, my face doesn't lie. Amber's, my wife's face definitely does not lie. <laughs> right? And so when God's breath comes into your face, your countenance changes, your face changes, your look changes, how you see changes, everything changes. And now we bear the image of a heavenly man. So Adam was dust to dust. Jesus was dust to life. Adam brought death to all of us. Jesus brings life to all of us. And this is where the breath of life comes in. When you are marred clay, the hands of the potter reforms you, and he takes out everything that caused you to be marred. When you were in the dust, he stretched and vexed you into position. And when you were dead in your trespasses, he brings life into your face. I'll leave you with this, John chapter 20, verse 21 through 23. So Jesus said to them again, now this is right after Jesus resurrected from the dead. What were the disciples doing at this time? They were hiding for fear of the Jews. They were terrified. They weren't on fire. They weren't preaching the gospel. They had forgotten that Jesus said he would raise from the dead. They were hopeless. They were fearful. They were hiding out. So Jesus walks through the door and shows up and he says to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I love these three verses because it's like a sandwich. Now, we all love verse 22, he breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. But 21 is about peace and power being sent. 23 is about forgiveness. And when the breath of life comes into your face, you get, you get three incredible things. You get peace, you get forgiveness, and you get power. And that's why I want to remind all of you, don't hold grudges and be unforgiving and bitter towards anyone ever. Jesus made it clear we're to forgive 70 times seven in a single day. And if you do the math, that's every 2.8 seconds. So you have about 2.8 seconds to manifest and be upset. And then you got to forgive. Because we always have to be in a pos position of forgiveness. And so when the breath of life comes to you, several things happen to you personally. And the disciples would have to have this personal experience of the breath of life for peace, Forgiveness and power, it was personal. But when Pentecost comes, it becomes public and corporate. You all have to have a private, personal breath of God in your face, the breath of life in your face. But we also have to have a Pentecostal outpouring of the breath of God. Why? Unity, oneness, speaking the same cultural language. Think about the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel was the clay saying to the potter, we're going to make and be like God and build a tower to the heavens. It was demonic. It was deceptive. God would bring it down to the ground and then he would separate all the languages of the earth at that moment so that they couldn't communicate at that time. Now God says, I'm going to reverse that curse by pouring out my spirit on Pentecost, and now everybody will be filled with my spirit, speak the same language, and be unified by the presence and the power of God, all from the breath of life. This is what we all need personally, and it's also what we need corporately. And so I want to ask you all today, are you dead, dry bones, feeling hopeless and cut off? If so, it's time to receive the breath of life. If you've slid backwards and found yourself in despair, hurt, pain, frustration, and failure, you need the breath of life today. If you need peace and forgiveness, especially to forgive yourself. So many of you bombed it, blew it, and you're not forgiving yourself. You're not grabbing onto the forgiveness that God has provided through the cross. And that's why Jesus said, if you forgive, they're forgiven. But if you retain... They're unforgiven. Grab onto the forgiveness today. Pick yourself up, get out of the valley of dry bones, 
Stay into the pocket of his army and his love. Let the breath of life get into your face every single day. And I even believe right now he'll breathe in your face. Right into your nostrils, right into your head, right into your life. And so if you feel hopeless, you're not. But we want to pray for you. If you feel destitute and cut off, you're not. We want to pray for you. And you never back down and you never give up and you get aggressive. I was once dry bones, but now I'm a part of an army. And it's not an army of one. It's an army of a family all over the world. And so today we want to pray for you. If you've been hurting, broken, frustrated, angry, sidetracked, bombed it, blew it, blown it up, burned it down to the ground, God's got something beautiful for you. He always does. He always has something beautiful. Always. And my hope and my desire for you is that if we wouldn't just hear a good message that inspires us, but that we grab hold of the truth and live it every day of our life. I have to live it just as much as you do. I have to fight the fight just as much as you do. But it's a good fight, and it's a fight of faith, and it's trusting God every time, always, no matter what. So if you need peace, if you need forgiveness, if you felt like dry bones, God's here to breathe some life into you today. Okay? Let's all stand. I want to ask my prayer partners to come up, my ministry team and my prayer partners. All my prayer partners and ministry team God's breath is like a neti pot. Think about it. He comes in and he flushes out your head. And he flushes out your olfactory system. And he gives you health and well-being and balance and strength and stability. You just got to let him breathe into your face. Let him breathe into your face today. So if you're hurting, if you're sick, frustrated and you don't know the Lord or you do and you slid backwards or you've just been going through a difficult time if you've been dry bones and if you're not born again I want you to tell these prayer partners when you come up and have them pray for you don't leave here the same today God knows what you need and he cares for you if you were that clay that got spun out well let's spin back in let God do what God does best and let him refashion and reform you Okay, So if you need prayer, you can start making your way up to the front. If you know you got sidetracked and spun out, well, come on up and let's get you back into position. Whatever it is that you need today, whatever it is that you need prayer for, that's what we're here for. Now I'm going to pray for you that the breath of God would get you right in your face. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the breath of life. Thank you, God, that you always resurrect us every time that we're down. Thank you, God, that you trade corrupt corruption for incorruption, hopelessness for hopefulness, weakness for strength and power. God, I pray that your breath, just put your hands out in front of you in a receiving position or lift them up high. I pray the breath of God to just hit you right in the face. Just take a deep breath. This is a prayer that I pray a lot. And I want you guys to pray it with me. Say, Heavenly Father, anything I've said or done that's not in your design, that's against your will. I ask for mercy. Forgive me, Lord. Breathe your breath into my life, God. Resurrect my life. Put me back into my design, God. 
everything you've predetermined for my life, Lord. I want to conform to the image and likeness of your son. God, I thank you so much, Lord, that today as we leave that this word and this truth and this life and your breath, that you'd always breathe upon us and propel us into the more you have in store. I thank you so much, Lord, for prophecy, that this church is alive with prophecy. It's alive with your word and your breath. And I pray, God, that every one of us would be led by the breath, led by the wind, led by your spirit. I ask for wisdom about our lives, wisdom about our future. And I thank you, God, for the spirit of revelation and wisdom and truth. And I thank you for your breath. Lord, breathe into our lungs, God. I thank you, Jesus, for your healing power. Just let God speak to you right now. We're going to continue to have time at the altar. We're ending early today, so if you'd like to come kneel down up here around the stage or at the front, if you need prayer, come up and get prayer. Please don't leave the same. If you've wandered away or spun out, get back into the pocket of God's love. He never gives up on you. He never gives up on you. Don't take that shame, pain, hurt, whatever it is. Don't take it home. Leave it up here today. Like Jeremy said, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. So take time. Take some time. You're welcome to have prayer. Come up to the front. Otherwise, I love y'all, and we'll see you guys on Wednesday.